Um, and we should just say, there is also the chance that she's just incredibly stupid. But I don't know. I don't think she's that stupid, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't think she's smart. I mean, I don't think she's smart. I mean, I don't think she's smart. You know, Candace Owens got in trouble some time ago. She said, you know, Hitler uh, got the nationalism part right. Mm -hmm. You know, Hitler's nationalism ended up uh, probably killing uh, millions of people, both in war and uh, through uh, an extermination program of Jews, who he felt were sort of tainting the national uh, genetic pool and blood. Quote, if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run, well, okay, fine. The problem is he had dreams outside of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everyone to, to be German. So, and I should just say, for those people who don't know the most rudimentary um, history of the, arguably the greatest conflict we've had in the planet's history, King Leopold slaughtered 10 to 15 million Negroes to further push the lie that the Congo was uninhabited. This is coming from an article titled, Belgium, Too Arrogant to Apologize for Killing 15 Million Congolese by Awe Lekmfa, June 18th, 2022. It says, to be assured, all European colonialists carried out unspeakable atrocities in Africa. The first and most benumbing was the Belgian seizure of the DRC in 1885 by King Leopold II, the brother of King Philippa's great-grandfather, under whose rule 15 million Congolese were murdered. This is the highest known figure of genocide in world history. Even in the lunatic Nazi holocaust against innocent and defenseless Jews, the highest estimated casualty figure was 6 million. Yet till today, the Germans show remorse, they paid reparation, and teach their children that there is no excuse whatsoever for such atrocities and that everything must be done to ensure genocide never occurs again. In contrast, the Belgians show no remorse, would not apologize, pay no reparation, make excuses for the genocide, do not teach this part of their history in schools, and have not campaigned against a possible repeat of their history of genocide. The Belgian government, they had to make a decision. What do they tell the public? Leopold II had lied to his people for a long time, and they looked up to him like a father figure who brought glory to the country. Not only would the citizens be disappointed, but it would make Belgium look terrible to the outside world. Their nation was still less than 100 years old at the time. England and the United States had already outlawed slavery in the 1800s, so the King of Belgium had essentially taken a big step backwards in humanitarian progress. The Belgian government chose to allow their people to continue believing the lie that King Leopold II had built for himself. They taught their children that there was never any slavery in the Congo Free State, and that everything King Leopold II did was wonderful. This lie was retold generation after generation, to the point where it became their new truth and part of their cultural identity. So again, the Belgians show no remorse, would not apologize, pay no reparation, make excuses for the genocide. This is coming from the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Belgian Jews greet King Leopold III on March 20th, 1934. It says, King Leopold III, young Belgian minor, today received a Jewish deputation consisting of the chief rabbi of Belgium, Dr. Joseph Wiener, and representatives of the Jewish consistory, the deputation congratulated the king on his having ascended the throne of Belgium. The king thanked the delegation and the Jews of Belgium for their loyalty to him. So, and I should just say, for those people who don't know the most rudimentary um, history of the 
Arguably the greatest conflict we've had in the planet's history. Arguably the greatest conflict we've had in the planet's history. Arguably the greatest conflict we've had in the planet's history. Leopold II truly was paying for all of the startup expenses to colonize the Congo out of his own pockets. He appointed governor generals to manage the various territories of the country. Leopold's men eventually discovered that the rainforest had a plentiful supply of rubber trees. This it was essentially like stumbling across a gold mine. At the time, there was a huge demand for natural rubber in order to make tires, but there was a very small supply. The only problem, of course, was finding a way to pay for all of the manual labor required. Leopold II, well, he ordered his men to enslave the Congolese people. Each of the governor generals had their own tactic to achieve this. Usually, they set a village on fire so that there was nowhere for anyone to hide. They would shoot and capture women of the village and tell the men that if they did not bring back 15 kilograms of rubber by the end of the day, they would kill their wives and daughters. So, and I should just say, for those people who don't know the most rudimentary um, history of the, arguably the greatest conflict we've had in the planet's history. King Leopold II believed that all of these people were his personal slaves and he could do whatever he wanted with them. King Leopold personally handed out bonuses to the commanders if they could produce more rubber by any means necessary. Leopold began to grow his own private army in the Congo called the Force Publique. When his men were destroying villages, they would pick out the tallest and strongest young men to recruit as soldiers. These soldiers were instructed to systematically kill anyone who disobeyed the orders of the governor generals. They were told to not waste any ammunition and that they must kill a man with a single bullet. They were required to bring back one severed hand for every bullet fired. If they did not, they would be killed by their general. This led to the soldiers cutting off hands of people that were still alive whenever they wasted ammunition. So, and I should just say, for those people who don't know the most rudimentary um, history of the, arguably the greatest conflict we've had in the planet's history, Leopold II created a human zoo at his summer estate. He built a model African village and captured 267 Congolese people to live there. Belgian people showed up to gawk at them, throwing peanuts and bananas over the fence as if they were monkeys. They were forced to stay outdoors in this village in all kinds of weather. Several of those people died of influenza and pneumonia. After he died, the king's estate became the Royal Museum of Central Africa, and it continued to glorify Leopold II's achievements in colonization. Decades after his death in 1958, the government of Belgium even went as far as to replicate his human zoo at the Brussels World Fair, putting Congolese people on display like animals once again. Yeah. Well, didn't they do that with an African man in the Bronx Zoo in like the turn of the century? They put an African man in the Bronx yes, Zoo? Yes, they did. Yeah, they had an African man, I believe it was the Bronx Zoo, oh my in goodness. like the 1800s or the early 1900s. Pygmy. A pygmy? A pygmy yeah, bada benga. What year was it? 1906. Oh, God. Wow. Yeah, it's, they had him in the zoo, man. <laughs> it's, it's insane. Look at that. Wow. Dude's in the zoo. Now they had their chance to put their first human on display. Hornaday quickly agreed to purchase one of Werner's chimpanzees and to house both the chimp and Otterbenga at the zoo. Hornaday planned to exhibit the pygmy and the chimpanzee together in a cage in the zoo's monkey house. It was presented as science, not as a circus act, because these were men of science who, who were doing this. Otabenga went on display in the monkey house on Saturday, September the 8th, 1906. A lot of, of what you wrote in this article is a lot of what I'm assuming you have a friendly relationship with Rabbi Shmuley has been saying about me. So it's really important to go through these points because when you write something so, like is a Jew hating bigot, that's very strong language. And we, we need to go through these points. So, so we'll go through all of them, sure. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Just let's just begin here. So you, you basically make the argument that I'm that I'm drunk on fame and that that is the reason why I have let out the truth about who I am, which makes me a Jew hater. First thing you say is that this is a woman who is such an anti-Semi and so ignorant of history that in 2018, she publicly said that Hitler was OK. Do you mm -hmm. actually believe that I publicly said that Hitler was OK? So from the recording that I heard, including the congressional testimony, which I think was taken out of context. 
And from the comments that you said, okay, if I, I and you correct if I'm wrong, but my understanding from your comments is you were asked a question about nationalism. Mm -hmm. And you responded about nationalism using the example that nationalism was good and that what Hitler did, Hitler was nationalistic in Germany, and that was okay. You have said specifically you think Hitler is a horrible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you have condemned Hitler, thank God, without question. And you also brought him up in that discussion about nationalism. Is that all accurate? So when you just write, she publicly said Hitler was okay. That is dishonest because what I actually was saying was answering a question, as you brought up, where we were not even talking about Jews, not talking about the Holocaust, a woman was asking about whether or not it's right. okay for people today to say that they're nationalists when it's often associated as a, a dirty word. And what I was saying was that it's wrongly associated with Hitler. I don't believe that Hitler was a nationalist because obviously Hitler invaded Poland. He obviously had ambitions outside wait, wait, of... So what, we have the clip. Have we have the clip. So we're going to play you. it. So again, that the question great. that's being asked of me is whether or not nationalism is nationalism is an yeah. okay word to embrace. Let's play the clip so we can hear me and what that I actually said. Yeah, I agree. I, I actually don't have any problems at all with the word nationalism. I think that it gets, uh, the definition gets poisoned um, by elitists that actually want globalism. Globalism is what I, what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in, at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist, but if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everybody to be German, everybody to be speaking German, everybody to look a different way. That's not, to me, that's not nationalism. So again, we're trying there to define nationalism. Does your statement, right. she publicly said that Hitler was okay. Is that an honest statement? Yeah. So let's let's talk about this for a moment. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, you were asked a question about nationalism. Mm -hmm. You responded with an example of Adolf Hitler. Yes. I said because Americans associate the reason why they think it's a dirty word is because of Adolf Hitler. You respond and you have subsequently and I've seen you subsequently. And I think you even said it in the congressional hearing. You have obviously condemned him for was. Um, but you brought Hitler's name into a discussion. Correct. Okay. And you justified that this is how America feels or how people feel. And that's your take on it. It's not necessarily accurate. And in fact, it probably isn't from, a, from an actual sociological standpoint. But that's your opinion. Fine. But Candace, you you put in the same sentence what he did if it just had stayed in Germany was okay. But more importantly, and here's a piece of the anti-Semitism. Why bring one of the most evil men of history into the discussion? You could just as easily have given any negative examples of nationalism. You chose to bring Hitler up. Not them. I did. And I, I have no, I'm, I, I, if I could go backwards in the context of trying to understand why Americans think that nationalism is a bad word, it was appropriate for me to bring off Adolf Hitler. It is totally appropriate in any capacity when you are talking about history and historical sentiments to bring up any relevant character that has created those sentiments. So are, I just want to, again, I just want to yes or no. After watching so, that, in, we, I, I want to make sure we don't run out of time here. After watching that in context, do you think it is fair that you wrote, she publicly said that Hitler was okay? Hitler was okay. Yeah. Yes, by bringing me even into the conversation, yes, I do. Okay, great. Um, the stuff that happened inside of Germany, also not good. It wasn't no. about declaring everybody Germans. <laughs> Basically, she's admitting that, like, yeah, the rounding up of Jews, the Kristallnacht, uh, the persecution and then extermination of Jews within Germany's borders are, is okay. It's just the fact that he kept, you know, he yeah. wanted to go into Poland. It and was, man, it was I mean, kind of about how some people aren't Germans, actually. <laughs> exactly. Now, and, and the Daily Wire didn't fire her after that. No, they, they only they fired her after her criticism of Israel, but not the Hitler apologia. Um, and we should just say 
there is also the chance that she's just incredibly stupid. But I don't know. I don't think she's that stupid, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't think she's smart. The same white liberals who used to praise you for your patient, nonviolent approach have now become openly impatient and violent themselves in defense of their own job. Not only in the South, but also in the North, right here in New York City. While they were busting heads out in Brooklyn, they were busting heads out in uh, Long Island, they were busting heads up in the Bronx. White teenagers came out in sheep, Ku Klux Klan, not in Georgia, but right up there in, not down south, but down in the Bronx. White teenagers came out there burning crosses to let you know that this white man here is no different from that white man down there. White Nazis, not in Germany, right here in New York City, up there burning crosses. Had, had a carload of guns ready to come at you like they came at the Jews over in Germany. And when they caught those Nazis, they found that one of them was a Jew. And that Jew ran around here talking about Nazis and some of them were nothing but Nazis themselves. You didn't hear them blow that up in the newspaper, did you? No, they tried to quiet it down. Why, when you find Jews who are Nazis, you really found some. In fact, I think you can find a whole lot of them who are not. Always running around here trying to make you get sympathetic for them. But you was a master at that. Make you shed crocodile tears over what happened to him in Germany. You tell him what happened to you right here. You haven't got no time to cry no tears for no Jews. Cry tears for yourself. Let him solve his problem and you solve your problem. Why, they only killed six million Jews. Only six million Jews were killed by Hitler. Uncle Sam killed 100 million black people, bringing them here. Yeah, 100 million. 100 million. Don't let no Jew get up in your face and make you cry for him. Ask him what happened with his forefathers when our forefathers were being brought over here as slaves. 100 million. Black people were taken from Africa. And when the Civil War was over, there weren't six million black people in America. There weren't 20 million black people in the Western Hemisphere. What happened to 80 million? Where did they go? Where did they disappear? Why, that dog dropped them in the water and worked them to death. He murdered them. He butchered them. He mutilated them. I mean 80 million of your and my forefathers. And you think that God is going to forgive him for that? No. You might be dumb enough to forgive him for it, but God won't forgive him for it. That's why God is after him. 80 million black people. Dead. Murdered. And these Jews got the audacity to run around here and want you to cry for them. Let them go cry for themselves. Tell them if they're interested in your problem that you have some of these stores. Instead of opening stores up all in your neighborhood and robbing your deaf, dumb, and blind. Yes, the Jews do that. And some of them blue-eyed Jews are going to walk away from here and say that I'm saying something anti-Semitic. Anti-hell. It is Jews right here in Harlem who run these whiskey stores that get you drunk. It is Jews that run these old run-down stores that sell you bad food. It is Jews who, who control the economy of Harlem and use it for themselves and for the benefit of Israel. And got no enough to walk around here joining some NAACP or CORE and think we're going to be blind to what they're doing to us. No, someone better pull their coat. <laughs> Someone better pull their coat. 
What's your thoughts? Please be respectful with your comments. Also, please click the like, click the notification bell, and subscribe to this channel. Listen, Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. Explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this back, Genesis 14, verse 13. Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham, born in the city of a black man, called Nimrod, grandson of Ham. Ham had four sons. One was named Cain. Here, let me do some explaining. Abraham, Isaac was the Jacob had 12 sons, for real. And these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10, these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10, these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10.